Yes, yeah, so this is going to be recorded. It's our first attempt at that, so uh, bear with us, and you have to look at me up here, and you have to look at me down there, but uh, thank you for joining us for A History of Schmucker House, and as I was preparing for this project, uh, I was reading an old paper that I had written for grad school uh, a couple of years ago on Schmucker's desk, which we have up on the second floor, and the thesis of that paper was that the desk symbolized the intersection of the personal, professional, and intellectual life of Schmucker. That that desk was used by his members of his family, it was in his home, it was used as a management tool for the seminary, as he was the business manager, the chief fundraiser, but it's also where he wrote all of his books and essays, sermons. And I really started thinking about it, and the house is like that too, it's not just the desk as a symbol of that intersection, but it's the whole structure. And it goes beyond Samuel Simon Schmucker. The home was, it was used by professors all the way up through 1986 as a home. Uh, and it's really a pastor's house. I've talked to pastors, church pastors, about the way that the house has been used. And they're like, yeah, that's how our house is used too. It's, a, it's both a private and a public space. So that's really what I'm going to try to be focusing on as we go through the presentation. Um, it is meant to be open and it is meant to be seen. And keep, kind of keep that in mind because we're going to return to that thought at the end of the presentation uh, throughout the history of this home. And for those of you who don't know, uh, it is at the end of this block on the corner of Springs Avenue and Seminary Ridge. And I'll show a picture in just a moment so you can get a better idea of of where it is. And this presentation has really helped me to, uh, to, to really conceptualize the house. Unfortunately, there are no extant plans to the house. Uh, there are no photographs of the house before the early, 19th, or early 20th century. So we don't know what the house really looked like in 1863 during the battle. I'm gonna put up a few artistic depictions but we all know the problem with paintings and drawings, how, how accurate they can be. And I'll point some of that out, that we there, there are discrepancies in some of these artistic depictions. Uh, and there's a lot of folklore that goes along with this house. There are a lot of stories that go along with the house that we really can't prove. And I am going to talk a little bit about the cannonball uh, mm -hmm. and some of that, some of that folklore. So it's really going to marry together, this presentation is going to marry together architectural history, material culture, social and cultural history, and uh, thinking about people and functions of a home. And think about your own home. Think about the way that you use your home, you use the rooms in your home as we go through this presentation, because that's what, that's what I was doing as I was thinking about, about what I was going to talk about. Uh, historians are always standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, we don't... We're not the first word, we're not the last word. And I have to give a lot of credit to this man right here, Abdel Ross Wentz, who was a resident of Schmucker House for 40 years, 1916 to 1956. And this, the image that you see on the screen is actually a picture of a picture. I took a picture of the photograph of Abdel that we have hanging in the front hall of the house, uh, marking the fact that he was such a, a long resident. In fact, he lives there longer than Schmucker does. Uh, Schmucker lives in the home from 1833 to 1863. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, so he's there for 30 years. Abdel is there for 40 years. Uh, and Abdel did most of the serious work on, the, on Schmucker House. So a lot of what we know, a lot of what I'm going to talk about comes from stuff uh, that he wrote. And you are also taking part in a long tradition of learning about the history of Schmucker House. Because I pulled this article from the Gettysburg Times, September 4th, 1968, uh, where Abdel, I believe that it's Abdel is the one that gives this talk in Old Dorm on the same campus. So when the Adams County Historical Society was here in the 60s, 70s, in the, in the 60s, they're giving, they're having a talk probably on this floor, probably out in, in what's now the lobby, uh, to learn about Schmucker House. So you're not the first ones to do this. And a prop may, they might even have a copy of the paper in the Historical Society. I didn't get, didn't get that far 
uh, when I when I was doing the research for this project, but it would be interesting to see what what Abdel uh, said. So let's look at the first artistic depiction of Schmucker House. In fact, this picture that you see on the screen is the first artistic depiction of the seminary campus totally. Uh, this was drawn in 1833 by an artist in Germany. And the story that we've heard about this image is that it was done without the artist ever having seen the seminary campus. And it was also an image that was drawn based on what the seminary was going to look like, not what the seminary looked like at the moment. Because it was drawn in 1833, the house wasn't completed until October of 1833, uh, Schmucker House being the house on the left side of the main building. But the other part is that uh, Krauth House, which is the building on the north end of the campus, wasn't completed until 1834. So that wasn't even, it was planned, of course, but it was not even built yet. Uh, I'll read the, the minutes from the board of directors meeting April 16th, 1830, when the seminary board resolves to build houses. The committee appointed to provide for and superintend the erection of dwelling houses for the professors reported. This report was adopted and the contract was made with Mr. Kritzman for the erecting house, for the erecting the houses was sanctioned. So in April of 1830, that's when they decide that they're going to build at uh, two professors' houses. Now, what's interesting about that is that it's not the same builder as Schmucker Hall, the building that we are in right now. They, they choose a different builder. I'm not sure if they weren't happy at that point with the builder or if they didn't want him to get bogged down. They wanted him to concentrate on the main, ha main building rather than concentrating on these houses. Uh, it's built at a limit of $2,000. Uh, to give you a uh, something to compare it to, this building was about 10,000 at the time. Uh, they they originally had uh, a limit of a, I believe it was 8,000, and uh, they went over by by 2,000 when they started making changes. Uh, and it was as I said, it was ready for habitation by October of 1833. At which point, Schmucker, the president of the seminary, his wife, and their five children move into the house and they're going to be residents for the next 30 years. Here's the house uh, taken a few years ago. This was the best image that I had. This is one of, this is a Rob Williams original, uh, our director of outreach. Um, I couldn't do it as much justice. It's the old porch, but I couldn't take a better picture and I didn't feel like going downstairs and taking a better picture. So I just grabbed this one out off of our files. Uh, but this is the house as it looked in 2019. Uh, it's a federal style home. Uh, it's, it was built in that model and I'll show uh, in a moment a few other images of federal style homes, but it originally contained four rooms on the first floor, one, two on each side of a central hallway and four rooms, uh, five rooms on the second floor, two rooms on the side of a central hallway and then one smaller room at the far end, which is now today a, a bathroom. Uh, it's symmetrical, has end chimneys, both features of federal style homes, uh, some round and oval shapes, and I'll, we'll show that in a second. Um, but this is the new artistic style for a new nation. It's, it's showing a rejection of European building styles. And it's something that as America is becoming its own country and developing its own culture, it's going to develop its own architectural styles. Uh, and it's, you, you notice that it's, it's symmetrical. It's kind of a square. Um, and here are some other pictures of federal style homes, Wheatland in uh, Lancaster County, the home of James Buchanan there up on the top. And then the Schreiber House down on Baltimore Street was built in 1860. And you can even see, you can see the symmetry a little bit better in those. And that's an outgrowth of the Enlightenment period. It's scientific, it's free of ornamentation, very, very sort of basic uh, structure. Uh, by the time that Schmucker builds this home in 1833, but America is moving away from this idea of, uh, of the federal style though. Uh, this is, even though the Schreiber House was built in 1860, and that's really an anomaly because federal style was sort of passe by that point. But think about the buildings on 
this campus, all three of them are federal style. Look at Pennsylvania Hall at Gettysburg College, which was built five years, it was built in 1838, it was built six years after this building. That's a totally different looking building. That's more Greek revival. So you can see right about that time, you're seeing this change between uh, federal style and Greek revival. So the inhabitants, as I said, over a period of 30 years, you're gonna have no fewer than 19 people living in this house. Uh, and we have the most famous resident and its namesake right there on the right, Samuel Simon Schmucker. A uh, little bit of Schmucker history, by now some of you probably know this, uh, but he's born in 1799. He attends the University of Pennsylvania and then Princeton Seminary. And he trains to be a Lutheran pastor. His father was a Lutheran pastor. And his first call, his first church, is down in Newmarket, Virginia, so in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, moves down there in, uh, in the 1820s. He has a young wife. Uh, she gives birth to their first child. Uh, the child survives. Unfortunately, his wife, Eleonora, dies uh, from complications about six months later. So you have this young man uh, in his 20s. He has a young child. What does he do? He begins to look for a new wife. And he begins to court the daughter of one of his wealthy parishioners. Uh, and the parishioner is uh, named John Steenburgen. He is a wealthy Shenandoah Valley slave owner. And they marry in 1825. Uh, and immediately, Mary Catherine, uh, his new wife, gets pregnant with what's going to be his second child, his, uh, her first child. But also, right that same year, he's beginning to formulate this idea for a new seminary in Gettysburg. So he's going to move up to move up and start the seminary in 1826. She's going to stay down in the Shenandoah Valley for a few uh, months, uh, recovering from childbirth. Uh, and then she's going to move up here and join him. For the first six years they're here from 1826 to 1833, uh, I'm not exactly sure where they live. They live somewhere in town, probably somewhere nearby the Adams, uh, the Adams County Academy, which is still today on the corner of Washington and High Streets. That was the first building of the seminary before this building was constructed. Uh, but by the time they move in here in 1833, as I mentioned earlier, they have, uh, they have five children, four uh, together, and then one from his first marriage. Uh, he writes to his wife early on that he believes that the seminary is located in the proper place. He enjoys uh, being in Gettysburg. And by most accounts, Schmucker and, and Mary Catherine Steenburgen are going to have a very warm and very loving relationship. Um, she is going to bear him 12 more children before she dies in 1848. Uh, yeah. Um, and she dies uh, complications from a miscarriage, we believe. So she's going to die in 1848, and he's going to marry a third time. Uh, most likely, it's, it's a, a marriage of convenience because he still has these children to, to take care of. Uh, his third wife, Esther, we do not know much about her. Uh, we know she was here. We know where she's buried. Uh, we know she was here during the battle, but we don't know a whole, a whole lot more uh, about her. Uh, but before we move off the, the, the Steenburgen story, uh, he is lucky enough to have his mother-in-law come and live in the house <laughs> uh, in 1840. So when I said there were no fewer than 19 people living in the house uh, over that 30 years, one of them is his mother-in-law. So in 1839, his father-in-law passes away, leaves the plantation in the Shenandoah Valley to, uh, to his son, Mary Catherine's brother, John. Uh, there were only two children. It was surprising that for, for that time that there were only two children. But John gets the, the plantation and immediately drives it into the ground with some bad investments. Uh, and so they have to sell off the plantation. They have to sell off enslaved persons. Uh, the family owned 40 slaves in the 1840 census. And they get sold off. And Elizabeth Beale Steenburgen has to move up here to Gettysburg uh, and lives out her final days with her family in the home. Um, she does bring two of those enslaved persons with her when she moves up here to Pennsylvania. 
and we believe that they lived in the house. Jesse and Clarissa Minor uh, show up in the 1850 census as living in the home. Again, we're not really sure where, uh, but those were two other residents. One of the big questions that we get, and this gets a little bit into that folkloric part of the story, is was it a stop on the Underground Railroad? And I'm here to tell you that I don't think it was. I don't think the house was. And we'll go to his son, Samuel D. Schmucker, who was quoted in an, uh, a post-mortem biography uh, of Schmucker about that story. In my early life, he said, runaway slaves would occasionally come to our house. Father would allow any such to sleep in his barn by day and I am sure assisted them, at least to the extent of supplying them with food. After the decision of the Dred Scott case in 1857, I, asked him, I once asked him what he would do if a fugitive slave were to approach him personally for aid. He replied he would never assist in returning a fellow being in, uh, to bondage and would succor any such that were in distress, and that if he were prosecuted for it, he would admit the fact and pay for the penalty for which the law might make him liable. So that suggests that the campus was part of, or a, a safe haven for those seeking their own freedom. How many times that happened, we don't know. Was it in the house? According to this, it was not. It would have been in the barn, which is on the west side of Seminary Ridge. Uh, the barn is roughly today where the Singmaster house is, the yellow brick house, um, yellow brick road, yellow brick house. Um, I suspect that the Singmaster house was in part built on the foundation of the Schmucker barn. There's, there's, it's possible you look at the way that the foundation is, is that stacked stone. Uh, the Singmaster house was built in 1901, and I don't think that they were using that as much anymore, so it might be partly built on that. So uh, it's not until the 1960s that you start to see this story about the uh, in, uh, escaping slaves in the Schmucker house. That's that's much, that comes much later uh, in in the story, almost 100 years after the battle. But let's go back to Jesse and Clarissa Minor for a moment. Um, they show up, as I said, in the 1850 census, again, quoting Samuel D. Schmucker in this biography. He said, we had two old Negro servants in my early life who had been slaves in my mother's family and were manumitted, but I'm not familiar with the details of their history. They were freed before I was born. I know that after these servants uh, became superannuated, they were supported by my father as long as they lived. So they, they were supported in a way that they stayed likely in the home. And then by 1860, in the 1860 census, there is a Mrs. Cole who appears uh, as a black domestic living in the home. And she may have been the wife of Abraham Cole, who's the uh, minister at St. Paul's AME Church and lives just down the hill from the Schmucker house. So uh, those are the people, those are uh, some of those 19 people who show up on the census. So let's talk about uses of the house. I had said earlier that it's this intersection of the public, the private, the intellectual, uh, and, and parts of the house sort of reflect that. You can see in uh, these images right here. Uh, part of the use was a Schmucker's office. And in the first image, the 1833 image, and the contemporary image, you can see that there's a door on the south end of the building. Uh, my suspicion is that this door, it's the only kind of weird, ex weirdly placed exterior door on the house, would have led directly into Schmucker's office. So students, visitors, guests could come in without disturbing the rest of the family. Uh, the desk that we have upstairs was likely in that space. Uh, I, we long thought that Schmucker had an office in this building when it was being used as the seminary from 1832 through, uh, through the time he leaves in 1864, 
but I no longer think that. He does write a letter to his son uh, in 1848, and he closes the letter by saying, I must start for the seminary. So he's writing from somewhere else. So that's my conjecture. Uh, it's also, of course, the home of the family. The northwest corner room on the first floor was used as Schmucker's, uh, I'm sorry, the northwest corner room was used for cooking, according to Abdel Wentz. Southwest corner, which is behind that door, was Schmucker's office, again, according to Wentz. He doesn't cite this information, but he may have known members of the Schmucker family and heard it firsthand. He says that there was a spacious hall, a family living room, and a family dining room, all there on the first floor. One of my favorite stories to come out of the Schmucker house is from 1846. And I don't expect you to be able to read this, but I'm going to point out a few things. So it's 1846, June 9th. Schmucker is in Europe, and his family gathers on a rainy day in the house to write this letter to the patriarch. Uh, and it includes Schmucker's aging father, John George, is there as well. So it's his father, his wife, and their children. Uh, they say that this letter was written in the parlor and in the office, which were adjoining rooms. Uh, and John Joseph, John George, I'm sorry, uh, Schmucker's father, writes a little bit about the health of the family. Mary Catherine writes that she desires to see Samuel soon. But you'll notice here that the handwriting gets different. The children were writing letters to him. So they're all writing the same letter to him. And you see right there, dear pa, my dearest papa. And some, and some of the older children are writing for the younger children. And a lot of those pieces say, bring presents home from, from Europe for us. Think some things never change. But that's just, I mean, it's to be able to see this piece, and I've seen the original in the seminary library. I mean, he, he must have gotten it in Europe and then brought it home. But to think about the fact that they were writing this and that you can see how much it changes uh, just really kind of gives me chills every time I, I think about this, this letter. Uh, another use of the house. We talked about how lucky he was to have his mother-in-law move in with him. Uh, and there is evidence to suggest that he builds an addition onto the house for his mother-in-law. Now, this is an image from 1842. And you'll notice there I circled uh, an addition that does not show up in any of the earlier artistic depictions of the home. And the answer may lay in an 1844 note in the board minutes of the seminary. Excuse me, September 4th, 1844. Board minutes reflect the frame addition put up by Professor Schmucker at his own cost is his property, and that he, in his, he or his heirs or assigns are authorized to remove it from the seminary at any time he or they may see fit. But this shall be done 12 months from the time Professor Schmucker vacates the house, and a month's notice shall be given to the occupants of an intention to do so. So he puts up a frame addition. The seminary owns the house. He owns the addition. And so that is, I think, the frame addition that, about which they're talking. Now, what I can't reconcile about this image is that there is a similar addition on the Krauth house. Uh, and both houses were supposed to remain roughly the same uh, over time. So did the seminary put a frame addition onto the Krauth house? Is, did they get it wrong in the image? Did somebody say, oh, just put the, put, make the two houses look the same? We're not too sure. But uh, I think that that's what you're seeing here in, uh, in this image. Uh, the Schmucker house was seen as a place of refinement the furniture that they had, probably the way it was decorated, uh, was, was a place of, of the middle class in the 19th century. And there was a fantastic book, and some of you who have been to talks before hear me reference this book a lot. It's called Gettysburg Religion. It was written about 10 years ago by uh, Stephen Longnecker. Um, and he argues that Gettysburg 
Gettysburgians desired to pass off this sort of air of refinement uh, to, to be seen as middle class people, but in living in a rural area. Um, and that one of the ways that this is reflected in a material fashion is through the household, through what you would own, through what your house would look like. And this is a direct quote from, uh, from Longenecker. The Schmucker's middle class household, including books, paintings, and a commodious home, and Samuel's prominence in higher education also indicate refinement. Uh, I've been doing a little research over the last few days on a Wedgwood china set that Schmucker owned, pieces of which we have upstairs. And in doing a little research and reading the paperwork that came with the, the china set when it came back to the seminary in the 1980s, it's not a real Wedgwood china set. It's not made by Josiah Wedgwood. It was made by a company of a man named John, middle name Wedge, last name Wood. <laughs> and if you look, and I was having this conversation with the archivist across the street at the library, if you look at the stamp on the bottom, it says J. Wedgwood, but there's the most imperceptible space between the Wedge and the Wood. And it was... It was somebody who we believe was trying to, to, to fool people into buying this set. Now, my question, my question is, did he know, did Schmucker know that it was not a real Wedgwood China set? Or did he buy it, which is probably a little bit cheaper, and people wouldn't know? Did he want to show this? air of refinement, this air of middle class respectability, but did he not want to pay the money? <laughs> and that would not be, I think, totally out of character for him. So it's just a fun story to think about. So let's get to the battle. How did the house uh, become part of the battle? Now, this is a, a photograph that was taken by Frederick Gudekinst uh, along the, it, it, I cropped it a little, but along the Chambersburg Pike looking west. Now, of course, you can't see the Schmucker House. It would be on the left of the main seminary building. But what this image does show really well is the Krauth House. This is actually the only battle photograph we have of either of the houses on the seminary campus. And remember I said earlier, the intention was that both houses were going to look the same. So this is the best example that we have of what the Schmucker House would have looked like during the battle in 1863. And it really doesn't look too far off from that 1833 image. Um, you don't, you know, the, the, the way the, the orientation of the chimneys, the roof line, uh, all looks pretty spot on. What you don't see in that image is a frame addition. You notice that, where this I guess I can't go back if I'm recording, where the, where the engraving showed a frame addition off the north, uh, off the south end, you don't see that here. So that's another thing that makes me believe that maybe that, that engraving was a little bit off. Um, but this is what we think, this is what we believe that the Schmucker House looked like. Now there's an interesting family story that occurs in 1863 during the battle. And this is told to us by Eugene Blackford, who's the commander of the 5th Alabama Battalion Sharpshooters. And on July 2nd, Eugene Blackford is here on the seminary campus. And he goes to the well behind the Schmucker House to get a drink of water. And there he notices a greenhouse. I stopped to admire some flowers, Blackford writes. The ladies within the Schmucker House observing this mark of humanity in a smoke-begrimed soldier and being ready to grasp at straws eagerly, now sought my protection against some of the Yankee soldiers wounded within. So let's stop for a moment there. That shows us that there are wounded soldiers in the Schmucker house and that there are women in there that are tending to them on July 2nd. Um, so go back to the kids. 
Uh, their feeling were, were very intense. One soldier had drawn his pistol and threatened to shoot the two women. The poor creatures were too much scared to see what they had but uh, had but to keep out of the room where he lay and they would be safe enough to lost their leg, uh, the, the, safe enough as he had lost his leg. So he wonders why they just don't leave the room, but they, they call him in. I went in, however, and then discovered it to be a hospital where they were very artful. Upon my inqu inquiring my name, they were very much struck by it and at once asked me if I was related to Mrs. Carolyn B. of Lynchburg. They there told me that their name was Schmucker and that they were related to the Steenburgens. So Eugene Blackford is distantly related by marriage to the, to the Steenburgens. This is my uh, family tree that I kind of put together. The one question I have is how are Thomas and William Blackford related, but I do believe that they're brothers. So Eugene's father, his brother, was married to Mary Catherine Steenburgen's sister. So there's this, this uh, distant relationship, but a relationship all the same. After some time passed, I asked them, did they not dread the artillery fire? Blackford uh, continued. This was a new idea and threw them very much into consternation. I advised them what was best to be done. I asked if they had any yellow flannel whereof a hospital flag could be made. After much search, they produced a red flannel petticoat, which I connected to the top of the house, uh, connected to the top of the house, and tied it to the lightning rod. Whence I afterwards saw it waving from afar. The presence of one of the Yankees within, too dangerously wounded to be moved, justified me in this. I would not have otherwise done it, even for the protection of the women. Nice guy. From the top of the house, I had a splendid view of the position of the enemy and would have enjoyed it had I not been a mark for the enemy's sharpshooters. In the evening when I returned after the cannonade, I found the house deserted. The enemy rarely respected the red flag and indeed conducted the war in an altogether barbarous manner. So, so we know that there were women there on July 2nd, but somehow they, somewhere they go. Uh, on the evening of July 2nd after this. And uh, at one point there was a red flannel petticoat flying from that building as well as this building. Schmucker would return. He had fled to Easton, Pennsylvania as the Confederates are coming into town. Sometime before June 26th, he leaves. Uh, he is a target for the Confederates based on his anti-slavery writings and anti-slavery views that are becoming uh, more and more radical in the mid 19th century. Uh, so he leaves and he comes back and this is what he writes about his house. The house I occupied was most damaged. 13 cannonballs or shells pierced the walls and made several holes of which were from two to three feet in length and nearly as broad. Window frames shattered, sashes broken and the greater part in the glass of the glass in the house destroyed. The archives of the seminary were, like everything else in my house, broken open by the rebels and the contents scattered promiscuously with my books, papers, letters, etc. all over the floor. So he comes back to a, a pretty much destroyed home. Uh, if you've been up to the fourth floor of the museum, you'll see the Bible that was thrown out one of the windows of his office into the dirt lane behind the seminary and later picked up by a... Um, Confederate and placed back in the home again. Um, there, in, in preparing for this presentation, I started to wonder, did Schmucker ever move back into the house after he leaves when he's warned of the Confederate approach? And I don't think he does. Uh, there's a 1979 history that appears in the Gettysburg Times that says he never moved back into the house. And I was I was like, wait, what? But then when I thought about that report that he says the, the holes, 13 cannonball holes, the windows broken, um, you know, he's going to move back here and it's going to be, he's going to have to live through a winter. He's not going to live in this house. And at the time, he already owned a house downtown. Uh, he owned a, a home right across from where Ragged Edge Coffee Shop is, where the member's first bank is. It's not the same building. But if you look at the 1863 property records, he owned a home there. Um, so I don't think he comes back up here 
I mean, it comes back up here to clean up and to see what the damage is, but I don't think he ever spends a night in the house after he leaves before the battle. Uh, and he's going to retire in 1864 uh, and move away, uh, move, move downtown. So the big question that we get all the time is about the cannonball. We're always seeing people stopping there, uh, looking at the cannonball, going up on the porch. And it's always been something that we, the staff, have wondered about the provenance of. Is that a, is that a real cannonball? And in doing research for this, uh, there in the Gettysburg Times, they have 1965, they give a history, and 1979, there's a, a history in which the historian giving the talk goes really deep into the battle damage of the house, basically reads what Schmucker uh, wrote and what I just said, doesn't say a word about the cannonball. And then in 1986 is the first time that I saw it in a, in a, in a newspaper, 1986, which is interesting because that's the year that it turned into offices. The last resident moved out and it turned into, uh, turned into an office. Now, I've talked to a few people who knew Frederick Wentz, Abdel Ross Wentz's son. Frederick lived in the house for 10 years, 1956 to 1966. And he said he didn't remember the cannonball there when he lived there. He also said to somebody, and, and you know, you can't really rely on this, that he put it there. But I, I think that it might be safe to say at least that it was not there during the battle. So, let's talk about the house since the Battle of Gettysburg. It's going to be home to five presidents and three professors between 1965 and 1986. And it's going to receive a major upgrade in 1895. And I was able to track the plans of that 1895 upgrade. Uh, it was, the architect was John Dempwolf, who did uh, built Valentine Hall next door, did the renovation on this building in 1895 to turn it into a dormitory, and built Glattfelter Hall on the campus of Gettysburg College, all done by John Dempwolf. Uh, you can see there that at this point, it's the residence of Reverend Milton Valentine, who's the president of the seminary uh, in the 1890s, uh, and again, who Valentine Hall is named for. Uh, what I say happens here is that the house is, is Victorianized. That's my, my word for it. But you can see that some of these elements are added that turn it from basically a uh, a federal style home to something that looks like what you would see on Springs Avenue. Wraparound porch, some of this ornamentation, uh, less symmetry. Uh, it looks, it, it, it becomes something uh, very different than what it looked like in 1833. Uh, also at this time, they add steam heat to the house, gas lighting, and indoor plumbing. So this is what it would have looked like when Abdel Wentz moved in in 1916. Here's the, the inside. Um, this is my office now. Um, these are all offices on the second floor, offices. Um, and you can start to see that there are bathrooms that show up on some of these, uh, on these plans, showing again that there is indoor plumbing um, added to the house. So Abdel Ross Wentz, just a little bit about him. He's a professor of church history and later becomes the president. Um, he marries uh, a woman named Edna, whose uncle had lived in the house before him. Uh, Edna uh, was the niece of Luther Coleman. And uh, you can see there on the bottom of that, of that article, Edna Wentz's total of 41 years of residence here makes her the undisputed champion for endurance. <laughs> Um, but they also lose a son in the home. Uh, Valentine Wentz dies in one of the upstairs rooms um, in, I forget, I think that that's 
It's in the 1930s, I believe, that he passes away. Um, and from what I have been told by people who knew Valentine's brother, Fred, again, I can't go back, um, dies in one of the one of the upstairs rooms of um, a kidney infection. The other story that I just heard the other day, I was again talking to somebody who knew Fred, and he was telling me that uh, the Wences had a dog when they lived in the house, and that at dinner time, Abdel would give a blessing over the food, and he'd start by saying, "Let us pray." And they trained the dog to bow its head as they all bowed their head. So there's some there's some funny, uh, it's funny there. Um, electric lights put in in 1916 and new flooring um, when Abdel moves in. Um, but up to that point, blood stains had been apparently visible on the floor from its time as a hospital. Uh, the garage is added 1923. And that's the last major addition to the home um, until our, our porch has been, is being redone right now. It's interesting that it becomes a topic of interest in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. I just did a search on, uh, on newspapers.com. I just searched Schmucker House. And it turned up all of these articles about the history, about lectures going on. Um, so around that time, people start to get really interested in uh, in the history of the structure and who lived there. Uh, and I, I don't know what to make about that, but it's good for me because it helped with this presentation. Um, the last occupant of the home is uh, a man named Herbert Stroop, who moves out in 1986. And what's interesting about this picture is that you can see two residents of Schmucker House. Fred Wentz there is the, is the left or leftmost circle and then Herb Stroop is the right. Um, but what's also interesting about this image is that you have the picture of Charles Krauth on the wall. And that picture hangs in the parlor of Schmucker House today. <laughs> I was looking at this image and saying, I know exactly where that is. It's right downstairs. So you almost have three residents of, of Schmucker House there. When Herb Stroop moved out in 1986, I was told by somebody who moved his office in there. This is a first-hand account. Uh, when Herb moved his family out, he had a private study in the house, and he just kept it, and that was his seminary office. <laughs> so he didn't have to move offices, which uh, was, was good for him. Uh, and we moved our offices. The Seminary Ridge Museum staff moved their offices in, in 2018. So what's my vision? This is the mission statement of the Seminary Ridge Historic Preservation Foundation, which is the entity that runs the museum. And one of the things that has always struck me about this mission statement is maintain the National Historic Civil War properties and architecture. Now, up to this point, we've been primarily responsible for one property, this building. But it is right there within our mission statement that we can take care of all historic properties. So my goal over the next few years, and this is not a, this is not a sales pitch, but just I'm laying it out, um, is an adaptive reuse of Schmucker House. Remember at the beginning, I meant that it was to be seen. I, 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 that it was meant to be seen and to be open, to be open to the public. And that's what I want to do. Um, I want to be able to use it as an interpretive space to talk about Schmucker's life, the family's life, the lived black experience on Seminary Ridge. Was it a stop on the Underground Railroad? Um, to use it as a hospitality space to be able to have events in there, have people come in, um, continue to be used as office space for the for the staff of the museum. Um, and I think that that would be what Schmucker would want, something like that. When we think back on on what he used his house for as a marriage of that intellectual, that public space. Uh, and in many ways, I, I really think that this that that house is is complementary to this building. We talk about this being the most important building here. And I, and I don't doubt that. I'm not saying that it's not. But that house has a lot of history behind it, too, that goes along with what was going on here. So I hope that 
someday we'll be able to get to that point. So thank you very much. I will happily, happily answer any questions that you might have.